It's June 2020, and this is Court Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm Andy, and I'm here with my co-host for the show, Patrick. You know, sitting at the house teleworking and doing doing the podcast thing once again uh, via a Skype call and uh, some jerry-rigging of wires and recording equipment to get the best quality of it possible. But you know what? I, I kind of wish the audio, our listeners could see you right now, you know, with your bandaged hand, with the video camera going on, with the with the mic. It's pretty. It's pretty. You have two sets of headphones on, I believe. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I I injured my hand the other day, so now I've got a bandage on it. Um, yes, I do have two headsets on. One is the Skype mic that I can sit there and talk and. He- through and then underneath that I have earbuds in which is actually connected to the video camera which is doing the recording on this end so that I can monitor the audio quality so it's quite the sight I was gonna say it is it's it's quite the setup so I don't know maybe we'll have to see if we can start implementing some uh, video into at least the uh, the YouTube uh Uh, podcast. So this month, um, the theme that seems to be running through our segments and and our lives really is the idea of preparedness. I got a chance to sit down um, via Skype with some of our folks from the city and the core and talk about what we're doing on the front of hurricane season as it applies to uh, the Virginia Beach area, the city of Virginia Beach area. Um, and you too, Patrick, you got to sit down with some folks and talk preparedness. Well, yeah, so uh, I got the chance to uh, bring together two of our emergency management uh, folks uh, to talk about um, the core's role when we respond to a national uh, disaster emergency uh, situation and, uh, you know, and how we're going to accomplish that uh, moving forward uh, with the social distancing guidelines and all those items that are related to COVID. Plus, uh, you know, the one thing that we did already do uh, is we responded to uh, the COVID pandemic uh, months ago. We were looking at doing the alternate care facilities. And so I talked to our emergency management folks about uh, that aspect um, and, and, and really just looking at uh, – what we were able to accomplish and and how it set us up really to to be in a position of success should a hurricane come and lord knows we're now three in and not even a full week or at least one full week into hurricane season we've already had three named storms so uh, mother nature in 2020 doesn't appear to be on to play nice either i i have to say this so patrick 2020 is giving us a lot of product to talk about on this podcast i don't know if it's good or bad but man we are not at a loss for uh, for things to say. As as part of our mission, uh, there's so much coming out that you know that we're we're responding to, and then preparing uh, for the next item to come down the line. Although I do have to say, I think we did miss the the murder hornets. It was a thing for a short period of time. I'm sure they're still out there. But you know, one one of the things also on that preparedness uh, uh, side is is. You know, we're looking at the long-term um, impacts of sea level rise and coastal storms. And uh, right now, our planning team uh, is in the midst of rolling out uh, the initial draft feasibility studies for the Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management uh, Study and Environmental Impact Statement. That is a long-term, try to say that three times fast. Or once. Yes, or once. Um, but the, so we have that uh, coming out. Uh, we just went into uh, the public notice period for that. Uh, that's a 45 day comment period, excuse me, 45 day public comment period. They had a virtual um, public meeting, yes, uh, the other day. They're going to have another one um, tomorrow, uh, right before the podcast actually hits the streets. Um, so they've got that. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have the, the Florida Keys. Monroe County uh, Coastal Storm Risk Management. And then next month in July, we're going to have the Collier County uh, Coastal Storm Risk Management uh, study uh, draft study come out. So that team is extremely busy with working towards uh, devising some plans of how do we handle this the storm risks and the sea level rise impacts uh, for those three areas in Florida. And you know, our intent is next month we're going to bring in um, a couple, at least one of them or two of them uh, from that team to talk about, you know, why, why is it important, what they're looking at, and, and 
and, and also, why is the Norfolk District working in Florida, which is typically where the uh, Jacksonville District is is responsible for? So we'll 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 bring those folks in on the next podcast episode and and have a nice discussion and and really help uh, explain what we're doing, what we're looking at, and why we're we're doing it. And and a side note to that that I think is important to point out for our listeners is that the folks that we're bringing in, the subject matter experts who are working these, uh, when you contact us, these are the folks that we're talking to. So you're going to have a link to all these people that you're hearing speak about these topics on the podcast. So if you do have questions, concerns, or comments, go down into the show notes and send us those emails because these are the folks that you're hearing right now that we're going to be reaching out to to get you the answers um, or forward your comments to. So just keep that in mind as we go forward with the program. All right. Um, anything else before we head into uh, the uh, the Virginia Beach and City of Virginia Beach uh, hurricane uh, portion of the program? No, I think that uh, we, 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 we covered it pretty well, and I think it's time to uh, roll into our, uh, our segments and uh, have uh, those folks who are working those projects explain exactly what they do. So you'll notice in this segment that the audio is a little funky in the beginning. That clears up a couple minutes in, so just bear with it in the beginning and uh, keep listening. It does sound a little smoother as we go forward with the uh, with the interview. All right, thanks. All right. Think of beach renourishment like going to the dentist. Even when everything goes well and you're prepared and you're flossed, it's still going to be, at the very least, irritating at some point in time. And you know it's necessary if you want to be safe from the results of neglect. Um, But it's never fun. And the level of trauma varies each time based on other factors going on in your life at the time. Now, I can make that comparison because I'm a registered dental hygienist in the state of Pennsylvania, so I get it. And I've also gone through two beach renourishments with the Norfolk District. So I dove myself qualified to make the dental civil works comparison. Now, what I've learned is few things in a beach community cause more turmoil and relief than beach renourishment. If you're not a coastal native, you might not even know that a beach needs to be replenished. And even if you are a beach goer, maybe you've heard the term, but very few know the ins and outs of this often misunderstood process. So we're calling this segment Beach Renourishment for Rookies. And with me today are three experts from the Norfolk District and City of Virginia Beach who are going to guide us land lovers through the purpose, procedures, and process of a beach renourishment. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming aboard. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Very cool. All right. So um, let's have Jim uh, from the City of Virginia Beach. Mm-hmm. Let's have you introduce yourself and tell us a little about a bit about your um, your position with the city. Sure. Yeah. Uh, again, name's uh, Jim White. I'm, uh, I'm, I work in Public Works, uh, Coastal Engineering section of City of Virginia Beach. My title is a project manager. That what that is is that I oversee um, from initiation of project schedule budget on behalf on the side of the city, um, overseeing projects to make sure that they uh, they go from kind of a soup to nuts type of scenario of, of from paper out actually onto, um, onto the, like in this case, onto the beach. Uh, and, and then at the same time, working with the Army Corps of Engineers on a federal project, I'm basically the liaison project manager representative for the city of Virginia Beach um, on behalf of, with, while working in partnership with the Army Corps. Okay, and now from the Norfolk District, we have Ashton Bergen and Kyle McElroy. Ladies, let us know a little bit about you, who you are, and what you do. Ashton? Uh, Yeah, hello. My name is Ashton Bergen, and I'm currently a Civil Works Project Manager for the Norfolk District. My project portfolio currently includes two hurricane protection projects. Um, These are the Virginia Beach and the Sandbridge Beach projects. They require regular beach renourishment to protect the Virginia Beach communities from hurricane storm damage. Kyle McElroy, I work in the um, hydraulics and hydrology and coastal uh, branch of the engineering section. Um, And I've worked with the uh, Norfolk District for about a year and a half now. And um, yeah, I 
I help uh, provide engineering expertise on both the Virginia Beach and the Sandbridge Nourishment Projects. Very good. Good job on the introductions. All right. So let's get started at the basics. Jim, what, like when I think of a beach, I think it's, it kind of does what a beach does. It, it lays there and we get to enjoy it, but there's apparently more to it than that. So what is a beach renourishment? Why do we need it? Give us a little background about that. Sure. Um, well, with regards to um, a beach nourishment, it's, it's primarily fueled as a result of you have an established community and we have a community that is actually on um, kind of uh, a moving environment. We don't have hard, you know, structures there. Nature wants to kind of wash over, flow away, and things like that. But when we're committed, like in Virginia Beach, to um, our residential beachfront communities, our resort beachfront communities, and our bayfront communities, we do have to monitor and maintain the beaches because left alone with storms and and just natural erosion. The beaches will, you know, would for majority would wash away, and then that, that would undermine structures. You know, our, our kind of our real estate tax. Just a side note is that there are over 450,000 residents in Virginia Beach, and we have almost over 20 million visitors that thoroughly enjoy coming down to visit the beach. Um, just like a road, I always like to do the comparison to a road is that you design, you lay out, you build a road, and then when you asphalt the road, let's say. You don't just walk away. You have engineers and maintenance folks that come back and they will identify the road and re-asphalt it. Same difference as with a beach nourishment. Um, if we just nourish it once and walk away, well then we could end up having running risks of storm damage to the structures. To start, that's kind of where, where I would say, you know, especially in our community, why we definitely are have a, have an entire uh, beach nourishment program. Also, you know, the city does oversee Technically, it's, it, we have eight beaches, which is a total of um, 12 miles of Atlantic Beach and five miles of Chesapeake Beach, eight beachfront segments that we technically oversee seven of them. One is a privately owned beach. And then two of those, the Virginia Beach and the Sandbridge Beach, are the federally um, partnership projects. So in short... And this, I think, I believe this is something you had said to me once. I remember water wins. Like if water yeah. wants to go and take something, water is going to take it. So we still have to kind of, you know, to, to work with that. We No, no, you're absolutely right. We do have to work with the water. Mother nature, the ocean, it's going to, yeah, it, it, it will do what it wants to do. But at the same, you know, uh, a lot of times to keep it a, as a, in a positive light, sure, there's, we, I, I know Kyle, myself in the coastal realm, you know, you work with folks that a lot of times, oh, well, just, just back away. Let's leave. Let, let's, you know, uh, what is that? Uh, leave the beach. And it's like, yeah, that that is that is an option. There is an option to retreat from the beach. But when us as like many coastal communities, for now, we are committed. And yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a real estate tax base. Fine, that, that's true. But there's infrastructure there. There are communities, there are viable communities that when you compare protecting oh, and just beachfront properties alone, I have this number. Um, if you think of uh, our beach in the city of Virginia Beach, if you took the first row of houses and hotels from Little Creek down to False Cape Park on, on the Atlantic Ocean, we're protecting over $3.5 billion worth of just real estate. I haven't even added infrastructure that might be right next to the house. And so in our last set of projects, primarily core projects or so, this last round was all of $35 million to protect $3.5 billion. It, you know, is retreat from the beach an option? It's a last resort. It's there. Uh, we don't ignore it. But for now, based on our abilities, funding, uh, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, we have a program and a plan that is able to kind of maintain, work with, kind of work with mother nature in a way, you know, of being able to protect the upland structures and provide recreational benefits so that folks can, you know, come to Virginia Beach to enjoy whether it's a day or a month. <laughs> <laughs> we prefer a month, like that revenue yeah. coming. 
<laughs> would be nice. Yeah. yeah. So um, let me let's let's talk to our Norfolk uh, folks, and and I'm going to direct this this one at, at Ashen. So uh, Sandbridge, Jim mentioned Sandbridge. Now, and you and I have worked together on that. The one thing, and I'm going to pull my word doc up here. So, you know, we've got this renourishment going on right now at Sandbridge, and there was some questions by that local community regarding the timeline of actions occurring. And, and really, so our listeners know, simply put, is that the community paid for the renourishment of their beach essentially out of pocket through taxes. And the start of that renourishment had gotten pushed back a few times. Now, right now, the project is moving along nicely. But explain that situation and what goes on behind the scenes of a renourishment that these communities don't get a chance to see. Uh, so schedule delays on a renourishment project can happen at a couple of different uh, levels along the way. First, we have the, the planning um, of the contract itself, which is kind of the behind the scenes work that you mentioned, Andrea. Um, so after we recognize the need for nourishment, like we did at Sandbridge Beach, and we received the funds that we needed, which we received from the, the city of Virginia Beach, um, most people don't realize that we're still at this point about eight to 10 months away from a contractor getting on the beach and starting the project. Um, during this time, the district preps the plans and specs that the contractor will need to get the work done. And, and we're also working to secure any permits needed for our sand source, which is uh, very <laughs> useful for a renourishment project. Uh, for the current Sandbridge Renourishment, we are using an offshore site, which is managed by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM. Uh, so during this eight to 10 months of contract prep, a lot can change, which is why sometimes schedules fluctuate. Another area of, of delay that we see with these projects is the contract schedule itself. Uh, so the, the Army Corps prepares the plans and spec specifications, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but the contract itself does not come with a clearly defined schedule. It comes with what we call a peer to performance, um, and that's built into the contractor. It's basically just a range of number of days uh, that they will have to complete complete this work. We don't specify an exact schedule, um, and it is up to the contractor to develop that schedule based on their own availability of resources like crew and equipment. This gives them the necessary flexibility to complete our work while balancing it with their other projects. And it's also a, a great way to guarantee the best price for the project as well. This flexibility is especially important when we're talking about hopper dredging, which are used at both the Virginia Beach and the Sandbridge Beach projects. As the pool of firms who currently have hopper dredges and can complete this work is relatively small. For example, on the recent Virginia Beach and Sandbridge Beach renourishments, we gave a relatively long period of performance of 300 plus days uh, for the contractors to complete these nourishment projects. This long period of performance allowed the contractors to work around a current restriction on hopper dredging that our district follows from the 1st of September to the 15th of November, which protects migrating sea turtles. Uh, so firms that do hopper dredging are balancing a lot of important work around the nation and sometimes the initial schedules that they'll give uh, to the district um, are, are changed due to projects being delayed in other areas or maybe emergency requests for dredging popping up in another area. Uh, this specific factor is why we saw some delays in getting the current Sandbridge renourishment project going. Uh, so all the factors that I just discussed combined can lead to a few schedule changes along the way for just one renourishment cycle. Uh, we do understand that these changes can be really frustrating to a community they're waiting to see their project get started. Um, but at the district, we do think it's important to allow the, these flexibilities so that we can continue to meet the dredging needs of not only our own communities here, but but also communities around the nation as well. Now, how, and, and anybody can answer this one, how many um, dredge companies are there? There aren't a lot, are there? No, Kyle, do, do you know more specifically, I guess, the number? I don't know the, the amount because in different regions of the U.S., there are small dredging companies that do more local dredging projects themselves. But there are three, I know what I consider like the largest dredging companies in the U.S., and that's Great Lakes Dredging Dock, which is uh, doing Sandbridge and who also did the Virginia Beach, Manson uh, Construction, and Weeks Marine are the three largest Um and they have some of the largest hopper dredges, which as Ashton mentioned, are the dredges that we uh, use for these uh, beach renourishment projects as well. 
Um, there is a one other large hopper dredge that I, I'm forgetting the actual official name of the company. They're they're kind of like a Dutch affiliate company, but um, you know, in in the U.S. we have the um, the Jones Act, which restricts the Dutch. Um, and the Chinese and basically other international uh, companies from actually doing any dredging work in the U.S., uh, um, especially with hopper dredges, which are in the U.S. have to be flagged U.S. vessels. So the Jones Act restricts that, restricts that. So our dredges in the U.S. are actually a lot smaller than the ones around the U.S. That may be a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> the Stuyvesant is a hopper dredge, which is... I think owned like this partnership between a U.S. company and a Dutch affiliate, which was also one of the largest copper dredges in the U.S. But it, it's it's kind of hard to say how many dredging companies there are, just because there are in re different regions, like in the Gulf and along the East Coast, there are some smaller local uh, companies that perform much more um, just smaller scale projects. Right. So, and in, in the end, and then to go with what Ashton was saying, it's not like just hey. We want to renourish the beach. Let's call up a dredge company and get to it. There's, you, you know, you have only so much time, only so many available assets, and your window is is small. But yet, and and tell me if I'm wrong, but being a federal, you know, agency or even a, a city or a local, you know, you, you don't, you can't really go in there and tell this company how to do their bit, how to do their job. You know, you have to be started this time, and you know, you have to do this. I get a kind of feeling like, you know, we try to give as much liberty for the business to do how they do it without the government or interference. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that's absolutely true. And as Ashton was talking about the schedule and, and just with the fact that there are a limited amount of big dredging companies in the U.S. and we can't use uh, due to the Jones Act larger vessels, scheduling can become a, a huge issue when it comes to beach renourishment projects. Uh, I mean, think all the, especially with all of these uh, um, uh, ports around the U.S. starting to deepening and widen their channels to allow for larger shipping vessels. That That's one of the reasons why uh, the Sandbridge project was delayed, just because hopper dredges are traditionally used for this type of work, especially when stuff is offshore, like more offshore channels. You can't use hydraulic dredges, um, which are more for inland and sheltered environments, just because those are like barges, whereas hopper dredges are their own self-propelling vessels and they can work in, in offshore environments. So that, yeah, that's just a huge um, consideration. Kyle, I love that you're a dork for dredges. Like, <laughs> totally well, I, for like well I did work for a dredging company for five years. So. There you go. <laughs> a big matter expert, but that was cool to watch. You were just in your element. So let's let's talk about you and, and what you know, you, you, you worked for a dredging company. So what do people we've talked about the, the behind the scenes kind of stuff and, and what goes into getting the dredge company there and starting the process. But what does it look like? Somebody walks out on the beach, what are they going to see? What do they need to know? And what should they be prepared for? All right. Well, there are kind of different phases of dredging. The first phase you can talk about is the mobilization. And usually the first thing people see um, is the, the, what we call the subline coming up from the seafloor. Um, and that that is just a line like so about 30 inches in diameter pipe, metal pipe coming along the seafloor, going out to a depth in the ocean to which because different dredges of different sizes require different depths in the ocean to where they can actually hook up to, especially hopper dredges called draft. Um, and so that's usually the first thing people see and the thing that they're most curious there about. What is this line? <laughs> coming up from the ocean. Most people confuse it for some sort of storm water or something being <laughs> like something bad being pumped up from the ocean, but that's usually the first thing. And then you get the mobilization of the heavy equipment used uh, on the beach itself, which are um, dozers and front end loaders to help move pipe. So those are the things people normally see in the beginning. And that usually doesn't cause any conflict because the footprint during that time is very small <laughs> that, that a contractor has. Um, and then when, when the actual dredging starts, like the second phase, uh, actual construction, the, the, what people will see is the work. Um, and what they get really interested in is actual sand being pumped onto the beach. So a hopper dredge, it digs in an offshore location. Um, for here, this Virginia Beach project, we use Thimble Shoals um, channel for the, to get the dredging material. We had two different channels, but the contractor stayed in Thimble Shoals uh, the most. And... 
they 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 sail to that channel. They dig until their hopper is full, um, and then they come to the beach and hook up to the pipeline that um, the subline, as we call it, and the material just gets pumped out onto the beach. And so that can usually just it's a spray. It looks it looks really dirty, <laughs> <laughs> which also people tend to be very concerned about. When they see it, it's a spray of what we call a slurry uh, mixture. Of odor as well. Sometimes there can be um, some some material in there that causes an odor. Yes, normally most of the odor is when actually the dredge is dredging, uh, when it, it starts digging up. Um, oh, I'm forgetting the word for it, but things that are like you know biologically degrading in, in the seafloor, and then it gets digged up and like <laughs> it's a bit smelly. Uh, but yeah, so it comes out in the slurry um, of what onto the beach and it, and it looks like really gray and muddy and dirty um and that gets pushed around by the dozers in the uh, footprint of um uh the, the area that the, the contractor closes off um and so for safety reasons we require contractors to close off a certain amount of area just to protect the public just so they're not around there when um when the especially when the heavy equipment is moving um, dozers and front end loaders and all this heavy equipment have very limited line of sight so it's very important that uh, we, we keep the public out of that area as much as possible. And we do require for um, for the contractors to basically hire people uh, at, to be at each end of their fenced area uh, to, to keep people from coming in. What you can't really always prevent against are surfers who tend to like <laughs> in the water and they can drift down <laughs> and sometimes end up on the beach there. But, but we do our best to, um, to keep the public, to keep the public out. Um, and then as a beach is filled, uh, so you see the slurry in this pipe and as the beach is filled and they tend to, for Virginia Beach, we had three subline locations. There's only one dredge, so the dredge work on one to the areas that that subline could do because dredges are limited in the amount of length that they have. So you, they had to have three um, sublines for this project in order to keep what we call production up, to keep the rate of fill uh, to be at the maximum amount so the dredge could move as quickly as it could down the beach. So they, they, they work on one subline, they usually go south and then north. They can use that subline to go two different ways. And then they move to the next subline, go south to, to, um, to connect to the fill that they just did and then go north again. Um, and then where you get the most conflict with the public is when <laughs> people are always interested in what beach renourishment is and they think it looks really cool and they're always really fascinated with what's going on. Because as I think you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that not a lot of people consider this as like a necessary need or something that actually happens. Um, so they're really interested in, until the nourishment is actually in front of the, the location of the hotel or the house that they're staying at, and then they can get a bit upset. But if the dredge is moving um, efficiently enough and if the protect production is going well, th there should only be in front of a hotel or a house for a minimum amount of time, usually one to two days, and then they keep moving pretty quickly down, um, down the beach. And that's one thing I wanted to, oh, thank, thank you, Kyle. <laughs> that was one thing I wanted to talk to Jim about and then Ashton. But the city has done a lot to make sure the beaches are working with the public. They're, they're as open as possible and that we're, they're as accommodating as possible. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, for the like, definitely Virginia Beach, what we, I mean, we sometimes classify as just the resort beach, even though it goes up to what's identified as North End, we, we want to, as early as possible, get out information of an up, upcoming beach nourishment. Um, that, okay, here's the time frame, here are the limits, uh, and then here are the potential times of where the contractor will be. Uh, and, and it's, uh, but and it, like as Ashton mentioned, with regards to um, schedules of the contractor, when they have a lower, when they have almost 360 days, begin to start that in a perfect world we would absolutely love to have the contractor come do it in winter time you know late fall early winter nobody's there hey they're on the beach they're getting it done or very early spring um but um, as we've seen with the with primarily virginia beach this uh sandbridge is it's cutting it close but i think we're going to be okay with sandbridge but with virginia beach we want to do the best we can um to have our our um tourism department involved uh and then so that we give them a schedule and then you know where the contractor is going to be at the same time 
the uh, difference between the Virginia Beach job being being conducted during the height of tourism season as opposed to Sandbridge being started outside of tourism season. Uh, we worked with the contractor to limit their area of um, of work, which you know, whereas it, with, with the Virginia Beach project, they were down to almost a very tight 700 feet of beach closure, and they would and they would conduct the beach. Whereas on Sandbridge, since we were pretty much out of tourist tourist season for the majority of the project, they had they had upwards of a thousand feet closure. And, and that helped them to progress and move quickly. They don't have to stop as many times to get to do the mobilization effort of breaking down everything, moving it, and then going back and then doing their work and then breaking down, you know, and reiterating the process. But it was imperative to have a smaller area. Kyle was mentioning or so that, you know, you, you, you work in that area so that we can minimize the disruption, hopefully for about a day or two, and then they'll be further, you know, they'll be further down the beach. And what has been great, um, where it used to be, uh, we would, uh, let's say city staff would just send out little, you know, drawing PDF maps from, you know, maybe PowerPoint or something of trying to identify where the contractor is, where they'll be. Now we've evolved with the Army Corps of Engineers of having the uh, interactive GIS program, um, you know, of, you know, where the contract has worked, where they are working and where they will be working and having that link to get that out to not only um, our, our tour, you know, the tourist industry folks itself, but to be able to put that out to um, all people that are, you know, residents and visitors alike to be able to come and have an idea of, okay, if I go to the beach at 33rd Street today, um, will the contractor be there? And they can kind of look and get an idea. I know that the, the program can sometimes be maybe a day behind, which is fine, um, but at least they'll have a good idea of, okay, they are working near 33rd. Well, we're going to go to the beach down at 20th Street. We'll be okay. So that, that's been great. Yeah, and I want to, and Ashton, I want to ask you about this. I, for our listeners, I want them to know the people I'm talking to right now, when you email your questions in, to the public affairs office of the district or the city. These are the folks who are actually are getting pinged relentlessly by me most of the time. And they are answering your questions and your concerns. So at the, between the news media to um, people, when are you starting? What's going on? Um, I'm reaching out to these folks right here and they bend over backwards to make sure they're answering your emails and getting you your information as soon as, as it becomes available to them or as soon as they know. So speaking about that, Ashton, um, so tell us a little bit about um, for you working for the on the federal side, uh, trying to get that, trying to communicate that as well. We're, we're talking about the viewer. Tell our folks a little bit about this viewer. Yeah. So like like Jim mentioned, the viewer, it, it's something newer that we started using, I think, last year at the when we did the resort beach renourishment. Um, and it's basically a publicly available um, link that our uh, geospatial specialists here at the Norfolk District can update uh, daily or as quickly as we get updates from the contractor. Um, it's a it's an interactive mapping um, web page, so you can actually move around and look at different sections of the beach. Um, we try to keep it updated with uh, basically the schedule of, of where the contractor will be um, and where the beach closures will be. I think this was a really good uh, step in the right direction of keeping the public more up to date on uh, what's going on with beach renourishment as it's happening. Uh, like Kyle mentioned earlier, it's really important while this is going on that we keep the public safe, um, but we also want to minimize any inconvenience they experience um, while just going to enjoy the beach as well. So we've had some great success with this viewer. Um, we try to publicize the link as much as we can. We're using it right now for the Sandbridge renourishment as well. And I, I think it's something that we're going to continue to use in the future on, on each cycle. And that link to that will be in our show notes for, for the listeners. Jim, you look at, you're going to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate with Ashton that uh, of the uh, for quite some time that I've been doing beach nourishments now, it's amazing to think how many years I've been doing them, that coming from, uh, you know, just trying to constantly be in phone contact with your um, stakeholders 
and just giving them little individual maps that are probably a few we almost a week or two behind to now evolving to this viewer and knowing that although it's going to maybe hopefully be seven years or five to seven years before we do another see the uh, next round of, of nourishments that that viewer will evolve however you know user friendly to know that we have that because with sandwich specifically uh, it has helped so much that i'm able to relay it and the folks out there they can look at the viewer you know like this is great you know as opposed to the little the little maps which they did fine they were good for their time but this is i'm glad we're going this way we also don't use phone books anymore either so i mean <laughs> <We don't. laughs> not that right. time. <laughs> sorry sorry jim not to take oh, hey, me out of the yeah. <laughs> All right. So Kyle, here's um since you I'm gonna have you be our our dredging up, you know, I call you the dredging dork, but my, my person. What can what, <laughs> the dredging guru? Okay, I like it. What can the people in the community, um, those listening or those who are um going to be going to the beach or who live, let's say at Sandbridge right now, what can community members do to help the process? um to be understanding and patient <laughs> yeah i think that's the biggest thing um i mean beaches are yeah just getting the information out there is the most important because a lot of people don't understand it i think i mentioned before that the slurry comes on and it looks really gross but once it's dried out and the sun bleaches is out the sand looks very nice but a lot of people are always concerned when they see like how uh muddy and dirty that it looks to begin with because they think we're putting worse material on the beach than um, what was originally there, which is not the case when you design a beach renourishment project. You try to find um, material that is of similar quality to what's existing on a beach. Um, but yeah, just uh, be understanding. Um, I mean, I think it's just to be not too frustrated with, <laughs> with it in front of your uh, a, a, apartment or rental that you're using um that's the thing and and uh, i know hotels and stuff can can help out with that by as jim mentioned the viewer and just making knowledge of that to to their um you know res not residents but the the people staying at the hotels um but yeah other than that there's not much <laughs> people have very little control over what happens on a beach <laughs> Um, right now, Virginia Beach is, is and, and Jim Ford and me, the most recent monitoring survey, and it looks pretty good. Uh, we did have a fairly active winter season this year with a couple of nor'easters, and um, we had Hurricane Dorian and another tropical storm, Hurricane Aaron, or tropical storm Aaron. Um, so it was pretty active, and, and you always expect right after nourishment for a beach to immediately redistribute itself because it's always it's trying to find an equilibrium, and that's something that people um, – also just need more understanding about, um, you, you expect like when we put sand on a beach, a lot of things people say, it's like, oh, it's just gonna disappear. Well, it doesn't really disappear. It stays in the system. You just may not see where it is anymore. Like it may, it'll be the new sand that creates those offshore bars that surfers and stuff like. Um, so it just redistributes itself in, and it finds um, it, its equilibrium. I mean, when we design a beach, we create a template, uh, but we don't, as I said, we just, you create that template to make the e the redistribution go as smoothly as possible, but it's still very difficult just because you can't place sand on this very, um, to fill a slope as we do on the beaches, it's very difficult for contractors to do. So so you just try to make a, a template that's easy to fill knowing that it'll be redistributed lately. And right now, if anyone goes out to Virginia Beach, it, it looks fantastic. Like the beach looks great, yep. enough space. I've gone out there a couple of times recently, and every time I always say it's one of the healthiest beaches I've ever ever seen. Um. <laughs> I love hearing beach people talk about beaches. You guys just talk about it in like a totally different. Y'all are engineers, and your minds think differently. We do, yeah, we do monitoring a uh, beach profile monitoring. The city does, and we make sure that the Army Corps, especially Kyle's group, receives both data and report because they can have, obviously it's a federal project, but they have it so that they can get an understanding and see, and then of course we have it um, so that we can gauge uh, how, what is the beach doing? Um, how is it, you know, um, where where is it uh, at, at, let's say in a certain year, how many years left before 
um, what's called the, you know, impacting the design template. And that helps us kind of for budgeting, outlook and budgeting purposes. But to add to what, you know, ab absolutely what, what Kyle had mentioned that a lot of folks, you know, after you've got a nourishment, you know, a few months later, or like we had some storms this year and we, we lost some material, or what appears to be lost material, it's just material shifting offshore, as she said. Uh, but the plus is what, as you want, you know, nerdy engineers like me, I get excited about, yeah, sure, that, that winter uh, monitoring port is your baseline. It's kind of just a new baseline. That's where we are. I get more excited about, can't wait for our, our consulting serving firm to do both spring and actually next fall. And then by next fall, we can kind of get an idea of, okay, this is what the sand's doing. Some of that sand we lost might have come back on shore over the summer. Some of it might go offshore. Some of it, as we usually expect, is heading on up north. Um, and it's just for folks like, I guess, primarily Kyle, myself, Ashton. Um, yeah, I can be a nerd with profiles all day long. You know, it's good stuff. So. I love it. I don't live yeah. in that world. I love listening to you guys. Yeah. So really, the, you know, one thing, and I do want to put stomp this for our listeners, is, you, you know, there are people out here doing this and taking care of this project. And um, Kyle, you touched on it a bit. Uh, we want to make sure people, when you're, when you're look, when they're looking for information, that they know they can come to us instead of the rumor mill to find out what's going on with these renourishment cycles and these processes. Uh, all the information is going to be in the show notes. If you have a question for Ashton or Kyle or Jim, please email us uh, at the email in the show notes below. And uh, I will personally make sure that they get your questions, concerns, and comments. And knowing them or working with them like I have, I'm sure you'll get a, a, a quick and uh, and and positive response to any inquiries. So I want to thank, this is the dream team right here. Like I'm looking at all, all y'all on my, on my screen. I'm like, I, I enjoy working with you, but I know there's a lot of caring for what you do coming from you guys. I know there's a lot of passion. Um, and if, you know, that, that just, it just speaks volumes in the work that, that y'all do. So I do appreciate you coming on and talking to the folks out there today. And, uh, we're going to have to revisit this maybe at a different time in the season and talk about like the surveying part and what, how, how things kind of, Jim, we can let you totally get your geek on and talk about sure. what you're seeing. Yeah, <laughs> well. absolutely. I love it. Excellent. Yeah. Good deal. It's, it's a comfort feeling to know. We've got such strong personnel and you know smart personnel that keep moving this forward. I really like working with y'all. So much positive. It's like a virtual hug, you guys. Like, yeah. <laughs> what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, and this is this is my funny quirky thing, is I'd actually like, like to take a selfie with you guys on the screen. Is that okay? Sure. Like, is that so well, weird. Okay. You know, I got I, I'm, my insecure side will have to take off the air glasses. <laughs> <laughs> my old man glasses. Oh no. All right. This is this is like like I said, bear with me. I'm this is my me dorking. All right. <laughs> three, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Right. You guys are the best. Thank you for being for good serious. stuff. All right, bye bye. <laughs> bye. bye. Exit out here. So I'd like to welcome to Core Talk, Wendy Ireland and Alex Schlebach with our Emergency Management Office. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, real quick, I just want to, you know, let's just jump right into it. Um, you guys have been really busy for the past uh, couple of months um, and not in what we would consider the typical role as far as responding to um, a, nat uh, a natural disaster or a, 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 a declared national event, uh, but in a, a pandemic, which I don't think any of us were kind of prepared or thought would be something that we would be doing. Um, so give me some thoughts about that. So I'll go first, if that's okay. I um, I don't think it com caught us completely off guard. We did see in the news that this was coming from uh, overseas, but we have not done as robust planning for a pandemic as much as we do for uh, natural disaster type events. We've been very active in, in um, lots of other contingencies, but um, having not experienced a pandemic to this level, um, you know, there are things that have happened that I've never had expected. Um, 
our pandemic planning is is really um, being able to conduct the mission essential functions of the Army Corps of Engineers um, while while still you know operating and and maintaining a safe working environment for our employees. So um, it's been busy, and maybe Alex has another comment about it. Yeah. So it really was. Um kind of caught me off guard in a way I mean we saw the warnings coming up on it um, but I never imagined you know we would respond with such magnitude across the enterprise especially uh, which has been really cool to see um, and then just taking that and working it into this upcoming hurricane season and how we're going to respond uh, during the COVID environment yeah this is uh, the first time I think in our history that every single core district um, that's stateside uh, was activated in an emergency response function um, that's pretty much unprecedented am I correct yes yes it is so so talk to me about you know obviously um, our role at the district has kind of transitioned um, from where we are with the pandemic and responding to that um, and and mostly tracking we we were geared up and ready to start building alternate care facilities that mission um, didn't come to fruition because uh, for one reason or other, I, I would say that maybe the residents of Virginia uh, heeded the governor's warnings and practiced good social distancing and really did flatten the curve to the point where we didn't need the, the facilities, which is good. Um, but it has brought to light, I believe, uh, some some ways forward that we now have to operate even as we you know embark on hurricane response and, and hurricane season. Um, Talk to me about some of the challenges that, that uh, COVID-19 presents for that, for you all. I think our biggest thing uh, with responding to a hurricane in this environment is uh, having to do a lot of things via virtual interface, um, especially running an emergency operations center. If we were to activate um, and keeping that social distancing among all our responders, and on top of that, I guess, would be uh, bringing in different planning and response teams with travel restrictions and uh, quarantine requirements from traveling uh, between states and actually coming into a hurricane zone where conditions are already going to be uh, severe following a storm and adding on top of that COVID. So I think we're uh, used to mobilizing together. Um... And, and meeting together and, and working, you know, working face to face. So um, I think Norfolk District is prepared for a hurricane response, having gone through the um, alternate care facility mission. The mission assignment, we didn't uh, end up building them, but the mobilizing our, our assets, our people to, um, to respond and uh, provide these types of resources similar to a debris mission or um, roofing or power. Um, the hospital mission was just in different uh, circumstances, but I think we're that was a good, um, although we never executed that mission of the build out, it was a good uh, exercise for us for hurricane season so that we have now been able to operate virtually and demonstrate those capabilities. Um, to still be able to respond, just it, it is going to be challenging, especially if there's a severe hurricane where we have to go to Richmond. So for those who don't know uh, what the Corps does uh, during a hurricane or a natural disaster um, response effort, um, walk those folks through uh, the roles and responsibilities that we have. I know that there are two uh, main designations. You have the Stafford Act items. Um, and then you also have Public Law 8499 items, which the Corps is responsible for. So if you could just kind of walk uh, our listeners through what, what we do. So, yeah, as you said, we have two authorities. We have the Stafford Act, which is under a FEMA mission assignment, should we receive one. And we have Public Law 8499, which is uh, emergency flood assistance. So. Under 8499, we have the capability to supplement state and local resources uh, in terms of flood fight. So we have HESCO barriers, which are basically very large baskets um, that we're able to fill uh, to prevent floodwaters uh, from 
encroaching on uh, critical infrastructure. We have sandbags that we're able to deploy across the Commonwealth. Um, and then there's also, you know, several parts of 8499 which really go into rehabilitation of flood reduction projects and coastal storm risk reduction projects such as Virginia Beach and Sandbridge. Um, and then FEMA, uh, some of our main missions are debris clearance and removal and uh, temporary roofing. And those are very common uh, after a hurricane. And those ones fall under the, the what we call a Stafford Act designation, correct? Yes. So given all that, um, you know, we're, we're praying that Mother Nature likes to will, will play nice this season, but we are not even to the official. Well, actually, today is the official that we're recording this. Um, today, on June 1, this is uh, the date that we recorded this interview, uh, is the start of hurricane season. And even before that, we're already starting off at the seas. We've already had two named storms. So um, are, are we ready to, to go? As uh, It looks like Mother Nature uh, is not going to play nice this hurricane season with us. Patrick, we're definitely ready. The crisis action team, um, Alex has designed a training that's phenomenal, um, building off of last year, uh, lots of you know, PowerPoints and lots of discussion points to talk to them about it. We're also going to go through a tabletop exercise with the crisis management team. Um, so we also activated last year for Dorian. So this, if we go to Richmond again this year, um, the plan is to, to socially distance and wear our masks and uh, you know, work separately in our hotel room separately and just come together when we need to for meetings. Um, so we still have the same uh, team members uh, that are trained and ready uh, with a, you know, a training curriculum to, of as a great review. Um, several of the senior members of the crisis action team are going to be presenting um, some sections of it. So um, well, I think we're, we're definitely ready. Uh, I just don't know when when it's going to be. So, um, you know, heads up in August and September, especially because August and September, are particularly the uh, the months of the highest probability for a for a storm to come ashore in that time frame. And, and how many um, employees with the Norfolk District are a part of the, the these different teams? Uh, we have forty six uh, employees on our crisis action team. Um, so roughly a little more than, um, you know, give or take, you know, 12 to 13 percent of the district is a member uh, of this team. Yes. And they represent uh, a, a wide swath of expertise, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, our team covers uh, several different mission areas uh, from operations to handle mission assignments and requests for assistance for flood fighting to logistics and the movement of uh, supplies and assets all over the state, uh, to finance and administration, as well as uh, planning. And you forgot the most important, the public affairs. Oh, public affairs, yes. And we public have affairs. a phenomenal <laughs> public affairs team, yes. And they will help execute the mission with letting the public know what we're doing and keeping our employees informed and, and uh, helping get the message out. And I have to throw a disclaimer as I am one the member on that team, so I, I had to put that out there. Um, I am not the most important uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, definitely our, our, you guys are and um, uh, the leadership and, and all the other ones who actually get the work done. I just, you know, you all make my job easy. With with uh, I must say everyone is equally important on that team, Patrick. <laughs> well, as I said, they, they all make my job easy with you know getting the missions done and, and really supporting the the, the citizens of, of Virginia and in the United States with uh, you know reacting and uh, working to get those uh, those communities back up and running as fast as possible. Well, I want to thank Alex and Wendy for uh, taking some time out of their day to, to join me via. Um, a Skype call. That's how we're doing it. Uh, we are still in social distancing mode. We have, have not uh, been able to all come together in the district, uh, adhering to all the, the CDC guidelines and the state guidelines. So uh, um, thank you again for, for taking time out of your day and uh, for, for joining me. Of course. Thank you, Patrick. 
And here's your Norfolk District News for June 2020. The Corps announced its Gathright Dam pulse release dates for 2020. The Norfolk District is slated to perform six pulse releases from Gathright Dam and Lake Muma in the Allegheny Highlands of Virginia between June and October of this year. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Miami-Dade County, its non-federal sponsor, hosted a pair of online public meetings this month on the Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study. The public was invited to learn more about the study and its findings at the identical virtual sessions. The Army Corps of Engineers will also host a virtual public meeting on June 24th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. to discuss a proposed remedial action plan for the area of concern at former Nanzamont Ordnance Depot in Suffolk, Virginia. And finally, in preparation for the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in November of 2021, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has awarded a more than $6.3 million contract to clean, repoint, and provide universal access to the exterior of Arlington National Cemetery's Memorial Amphitheater. All these stories and more can be found on our website, and that link is in the show notes. As always, thanks for tuning in this month. If you or someone you know is interested in working for the Corps of Engineers, go on to our website found in the show notes below and over to the Careers tab. We have a list of direct hiring actions as well as those listed on USA Jobs. Until next time. This is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. Core Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the district's Polar staff.